Bwana Sifiwe, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, being part of this broadcast today. Today I'm in red and I have a red pen and I want to talk about the red blood of Jesus Christ. That becomes my topic for this hour. Um, I want to teach on the blood of Jesus. I want to teach on the blood of Jesus now. Um, let me ask, let me ask uh, so politely that um, this is not a preaching, this is a teaching. It's not a preaching, it's a teaching. So I kindly request that um, you get three things. One, get a notebook, get a pen, and um, get a cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, or a glass of water, or whatever you, uh, you use when you want to concentrate, because I want to just do this as a lesson, that um, I want to teach on the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. I'm, I'm dressed as a priest, uh, in red to talk about the blood of Jesus and um, uh, then let's see what the Lord has in store for us and um, let's pray. Father we pray that as we learn about the blood of Jesus that you would open up our minds, you would open up our ears, our spiritual ears that we may be able to capture the revelation of your word even as we go through this teaching today. We pray that Father you you will release the spirit of understanding, uh, the spirit of revelation, even as we teach your word in Jesus' name I pray. And you say, Amen, Amen. Now, um, I, I realize that um, we know about the blood of Jesus and uh, we use it for warfare. And uh, it is the blood that uh, saves us. But um, I would really want to go into details today. And... Um, I'll try very soberly to teach on the blood of Jesus and uh, try to teach you as many things uh, as far as the blood of Jesus is concerned. And um, for this broadcast, I want to concentrate on um, uh, the exploits of the blood of Jesus. What did the blood of Jesus secure for us? Why is the blood of Jesus important to believers? Why is the blood of Jesus so pivotal in uh, our Christian faith? Um, I, I've not heard of any other religion in the world that really lays a lot of claim and lays a lot of importance in the blood of the object uh, of worship. But as far as Christianity is concerned, the blood of Jesus is one of the pillars as far as Christianity is concerned. In other words, I say it is a pillar because if you put away the blood of Jesus, it becomes impossible for Christianity to be Christianity again because it is the blood of Jesus, you know, that um, did so many exploits that we will, look at, uh, we will look at right now and then we will see why the blood of Jesus is so important in the life of every believer. Most of the time we find ourselves, you know, using words, but we don't know the meaning of the words, using, you know, weapons, but we don't know how to use those weapons. Now understand, every time, if I'm given a machine gun, I've never used one. The only machine gun I have used is this one, is the Bible. Now if you give me a real one that I've never used before, I don't know how to use a machine gun. I've watched quite a number of movies, but understand, a real machine gun is so different from a movie machine gun. So um, at times we have words that we use in our Christian life, but we don't know the intensity. And when we don't know the intensity of... Um, you know of, of, of the weapons of the words and um, you know the objects like if you don't know the intensity of what the cross was all about uh, the much you'll do about it is uh, maybe just put it on on, on, on your on your on your neck but um, you may not be able to explain much why do we uh, really reverence why do we really honor the cross why do we really sing songs about the cross and so on and so forth so I remember when I was in high school uh, we went for we went for a, a, a rally and we went to a, a, another school rally. It was an afternoon Sunday afternoon rally. Those of us who've gone through the system, and uh, there was this preacher man who had come from Nairobi, and um, uh, I'll never forget his pastor Nixon Osumba. Still many selling the gospel until now. Some of us are products of his mentorship, and um, uh, you know Pastor Nixon Osumba. And I didn't know he's he's called Reverend Nixon Osumba. And uh, he came with some people from Nairobi, and uh, you know the way they dress, the way they they smell, uh, everything was not like the village where we were. And in the course of their ministry, they used one word. They said, Father, wh whatever they were doing, they, they said something like, Father, then they said the word emancipate. Now, I didn't hear anything else in that rally. I only had that one word, emancipate. 
and uh, they were talking about emancipate emancipation i had not even listened to bob marley and uh his songs about emancipation from mental slavery so i didn't know what this emancipate emancipation was uh i didn't know nothing about it so when we went back to our school it was a boys school um when we went back to school the following sunday they were in for a road shop when i stood in front to lead the worship in school um i started by saying father we emancipate you father we emancipate you in the name of jesus and the people were amazed because um, it's a new word they don't know what it means uh, but i was there so seriously emancipating god only to realize later on in life that the word emancipate means to set free so there are words that we use because of um, how those words how heavy they sound but we don't know what they mean so we misuse the words they say every freedom if it is left unchecked it is subject to abuse so i use the word emancipate and i was liberating god i was delivering god i was setting him free from every form of captivity but that's madness and stupidity it's only that um, i didn't understand what the word emancipate uh, meant and uh, the bible says in Acts 17 verse number 30 that in the days of ignorance god overlooks but now he commands that every man be saved so um I don't want us to be in ignorance as far as the, the blood of Jesus is, is, is concerned. And I want to go right into the teaching. I think I've done quite a big, um, quite a lengthy uh, intro, but I want to go right into the teaching. And I want to show you the exploits of the blood of Jesus. What has the blood of Jesus accomplished for us? I need you to have a pen, I need you to have a page, and I need you to have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea if you can. Uh, then let's go through now. If I start from first John chapter number one and verse number seven, uh, first John chapter number one and verse number seven. Uh, there are some words that look and that seem so synonymous, but they are, you know, these words are peculiar in their own right. And uh, I will be able to first of all look at those words that deal with, you know, um, that deal with uh, the washing of sin or the the, the, the doing away with sin. Uh, there are several words that um, the blood of Jesus or the, the, there are several words that the Bible uses as far as the blood of Jesus is concerned with how it deals with sin. Now, the first word that you need to write down is that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So the first one, the first exploit of the blood is that it cleanses us from all sin. First John, please be ready to read more than 20 scriptures today and write more than 20 scriptures. It says this in first John chapter number one and verse number seven. It says that, uh, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, it cleanses us from all sin. So the first exploit we see, I'm not, you know, preaching or teaching this in, uh, in, in, in order of hierarchy. I'm not saying that this is bigger than this. So uh, don't be fooled by number one, number two. I'm only saying this, you know, in a way that we will be able to, there is, there's no chronology that I'm using here. I'm just releasing a revelation here. So the first exploit that the blood of Jesus does, I'll try not to explain much. I'll allow the scriptures to explain themselves. The first thing that the blood of, or one of the things that the blood of Jesus accomplished for for us is that the blood of Jesus cleansed or cleanses us from all sin. I want you to understand and I want you to see this because I will not go into depth. Um, I, I'm trusting that God will give you the revelation of his word even though I will not go into depth now but I want you to highlight one thing it cleanses all sin. It doesn't matter what you did before it doesn't matter how grave your sins were. It doesn't matter how many people were affected by the sins that you did. It doesn't matter how young or how old. It doesn't matter how, you know, your sins were, whether they were done during the day or done during the night, whether they were done against a human being or done against an animal, whether they were done against an organization or done against, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter whether it is sins where, you know, you committed or you omitted. It doesn't matter whether you are passive in the sin or you are active in the sin. Now, all I want you to understand and underline here is that the blood of Jesus has the potential, has the power, the capacity, the ability, and it has demonstrated it, that the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, it cleanses us from all sin. There are several people that are, live the rest of their life in guilt because of things they did in high school, 
things they did in the, while they were in the university, things they did, you know, while they were married, things they, things they did while they were employed, things they did while they were young. I want you to understand if you can take the word of God literally as it is. This is the simplicity of the gospel. Second Corinthians 11 verse number 3, the simplicity of the gospel. Now understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. I want you to understand that your sin is not unique. It is not peculiar. Whatever has given you sleepless nights, as far as guilt is concerned, I want you to lay your hope and I want you to lay your faith on this one thing. That when Jesus shed his blood on that cross, and even before the cross, we'll come back at a particular time and now we're going to look at places and times where Jesus shed his blood because it's not just on the cross. There are the places where he shed his blood for specific reasons. Let me not combine these two because now it will be more than two hours. I'm looking at like one hour for this now. So the first thing we need to understand is that uh, the blood of Jesus cleanses underlying all sin. If you can receive this word, you will receive your deliverance from guilt, from shame, you will receive your deliverance from, you know, the way you have sidelined yourself. You will receive your deliverance from the way you have, you know, branded yourself, your low self-esteem when you understand that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. It cleanses from all sin. I'm done with that. The second thing I want to look at is that the blood of Jesus sanctifies. The blood of Jesus sanctifies, makes holy. It sanctifies. In Hebrews 13 and verse number 12, Hebrews 13 and verse number 12. Uh, I will try and read as many scriptures as possible. Now the Bible says this, that therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. I don't want to go to the book of Leviticus and start saying why, and start showing you why Jesus was not crucified inside Jerusalem, but he was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem, a place called uh, Calvary. I, um, I don't want to go into details why he was crucified outside because now that will lengthen uh, our teaching, but I just want to look at the exploits, then we'll come back. Now, the blood of Jesus sanctifies, in other words, it makes holy. Now, the first place we said it cleanses. Now, the other one that is used as far as the blood of Jesus, I want to use every of the words so that you can see how thorough the blood of Jesus or how thorough Jesus through his blood dealt with sin and dealt with every other form of bondage. So the second word here is that the blood of Jesus sanctifies. Hebrews chapter number 13 and verse number 12. The blood of Jesus is sanctifies. Now, the other word that I want us to see, and now I know you know this verse in Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 22. And let me say this uh, even as we go on. If, if, if you really are interested in learning about the blood of Jesus, you will not avoid uh, some key two chapters. Is Hebrews chapter number 9 and Hebrews chapter number 10. You will not avoid those two chapters now. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 22, we get the next word, and um, the next word is forgiveness or remission. It's the word remission or forgiveness. So it says this, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. In other words, there's no forgiveness of sin. I believe the NIV will say something, there's no forgiveness of sin. So there, 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 there are two ones here, married into one, um, and they that the Lord has joined together, let no man put asunder. So the third thing here is that uh, the blood of Jesus forgives sin. Understand, it cleanses sin, it sanctifies from sin, it forgives, it, it brings remission, it brings forgiveness of sin. I want you to see how thorough the blood of Jesus deals with sin. Now, there are dimensions of sin. There is transgression. There is iniquity. Uh, there is also this transgression. There is uh, this iniquity. And then there's what we just, uh, you know, plainly just call sin. Then there's what we call wickedness. Okay. And then there's, uh, there's iniquity and so on and so forth. Now, the, the blood of Jesus deals with all aspects of sin. You know uh, unilaterally but very differently as in, it's like in the blood of Jesus there are different components in the blood that attacks a particular thing for example I would say it's just like the way when you have a headache and you take a panadol or paracetamol it attacks the pain that is in your head or that is on your tooth or in your tooth the blood of Jesus has components in it that dealt specifically with specific elements or specific dimensions of sin so we've talked about cleansing and sanctification. Now the third one is that the blood of Jesus brings remission. It brings the forgiveness of sin. Now I will say this to you child of God so quickly. God has never had any issue with forgiving anyone of us our sins. I will say that again. 
God has never had any issue. He has never put any conditions. There are no preconditions that are, uh, first of all, do this, do this, do this. If you don't do this, if you don't do this, I will not forgive you. No. He is always willing. He has always been willing to forgive us our sins. The only thing that remains is that we must come to him for, with, uh, we must come to him and ask for the forgiveness of sin. We must come to him in repentance so that our sins becomes forgiven. Now, God has never had an issue forgiving every, any one of us. And I sense it so, you know, so, so strongly in me that um, what remains is the majority of us to forgive ourselves. Majority of us are in guilt, shame. Majority of us have low self-esteem. Majority of us can, you know, have this, you know, we have this. We have the way we hide our face from people. Because I don't know if you've been there when you've done something and you look at people and every one of them seems to know what you did. It's like you look at a person, a total stranger, and it's like they can read right through your face and see what is in your mind, see what you did, you know, several hours before, several years before. And some of us have lived the rest of our lives, you know, with the guilt of things we did. God forgave us, yes, but this is the thing I wanted to push through. We've never forgiven ourselves. So I want to say this, he says, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So I want every one of us to understand that the forgiveness of sin is available for everyone. That is why when Jesus is being crucified, there are two thieves that are crucified, you know, besides him. And um, one of them is arrogant and um, he, you know, he's mocking him. If you're the savior, you saved other people. Why can't you save yourself from the cross? But the, the second one tells, you know, tells the other thief, you know, don't tell him like that. Or don't say like that because as we are, you know, we are rightfully crucified. But this man is crucified for things he did not do. And the thief tells Jesus right on the cross that master Jesus, when you get to paradise when you get to your place please remember me and jesus tells him to, to this 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 hour immediately uh, you will be with me in paradise understand the thief was forgiven on the cross he did not have to meet you know the seven conditions he did not have to go see the padre he did not have to go see the priest he did not have to go see the pope please understand as far as the forgiveness of sin is concerned that forgiveness has already been paid for by the precious blood of our lord jesus christ so the third word you will find um the third exploit of the blood is the forgiveness of sin now the fourth one that you will find it will resemble the first one but i decided to have it also again is in uh, hebrews chapter number nine if you look at verse number 14 Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 14. The fourth one you'll find is that the blood of Jesus cleanses conscience. It cleanses sin where we started uh, in 1 John 1, verse number 7. But now in Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 14, it says this. That how much more shall the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot or blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. There are so many people who feel they don't qualify, they don't meet the criteria. There are so many people who feel that um, they don't have the edge. As far as serving God is concerned because um, their conscience condemns them. There is guilt, there is, there is just a weight they carry in them and they know God can use every other person but God cannot use someone that has aborted two, three times like me. Um, I'm giving an example, men do not abort, so I'm giving an example. Um, uh, thank you Holy Spirit. Cleanse our conscience. There are people that, um, and, and, and I know this will resonate with so many of us. Uh, I don't know if you have ever been there. I have been there so many times. I want you to understand that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Paul says in First uh, Timothy 1 verse number 15, Jesus Christ came to save sinners and I'm one of the best sinners he has ever had. I'm one of the sinners, of, if there were any graduation, a PhD is so low. Uh, they, they need to look for something higher uh, that they want to give some of us because we we were good sinners, good sinners, good sinners. Now, now what did I want to say? I wanted to say this. I wanted to say this. Have you ever been in a place where it's a time for worship and you're lifting your holy hands before God and you're so deep you have sunk into the moment and as you're worshiping God, the stupid Satan, foolish devil, reminds you of something in that moment, you're crying, you're enjoying the presence, and you can sense, I don't want to use the word feel, you can sense that you are en you're enjoying a breakthrough of some sort, then the devil reminds you of something, and right at that moment, your conscience becomes defiled, you're lifting your hands, and slowly but surely, you start taking your hands down, 
and you check if people are observing because at that moment you feel it's like whatever you did has been published on the screens uh, inside the church and at that moment you start feeling it's like even the visiting preacher is seeing you and you start making a prayer father i pray hide me don't let him have a word of knowledge about me your conscience is defiled your conscience is contaminated with now understand the blood of goats and the blood of bulls will be able to do everything for the children of Israel. But there is one thing that the blood of goats and the blood of, of, of cattle and the sheep will not do. It will not cleanse the conscience of the offender. The offender would come with a, with a bull and it will be offered at the tabernacle, offered at, 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 at the altar of sacrifice. It will be offered there and the blood sprinkled and um, everything done every ritual done but when the offender is going they will know that the ritual has forgiven them or they've been forgiven because of the ritual but in their conscience they still carry the memory of what they did and they still carry the penalty you know in them they still carry the weight of whatever they did but the plus the up the over and above exploit of the blood of Jesus is that it cleanses the deed and cleanses the doer and cleanses the, the, the conscience of the doer. So it is only the blood of Jesus, and please hear me, it is only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse your conscience from the memories and the impact of an abortion, that can cleanse your conscience, you know, from the impact of murder. It is only the blood of Jesus. You can go through the prison, uh, you, can, you can serve a jail term of 20 years for murder or 30. I'm not a judge, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how much, you know, how many years they, you, you serve for that. You can serve a jail term for 30, 40, 50 years, but even after 50 years, they release you from prison, they will have released you back into the society, but your conscience, it is only the blood of Jesus that can cleanse that conscience. You may have done something deliberately against someone, and you went to them for forgiveness, or maybe you did not even go to them for forgiveness, and every time you see them, you feel condemned. I will tell you what is happening. You have never opened up that the blood of Jesus would wash your conscience. Hallelujah. So the, 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 the fourth one is, is, is that the blood of Jesus cleanses conscience. Now, the fifth one is that it reconciles. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 20. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him jesus whether things on earth or things in heaven having made peace look through the blood of his cross through the blood of his cross now the blood of jesus reconciles in other words the blood of jesus mediates or mediated but i want to use the present continuous the blood of jesus mediates between us and god the blood of jesus mediates the relationship between us and the father now, as it happened in the days of Exodus, chapter number, chapter number 12, if you read from almost the whole chapter, is about the Passover, uh, but specifically verse number 22 to 24, you'll find when God tells them, and when I see the blood, you know, when the angel sees the blood, he will pass over. When the angel sees the blood, he will pass over. Now understand, the blood of Jesus, when, 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 when the Father looks at us, what he sees between us and him is the bridge. Of the blood of his son now hear me child of God none of us is so good regardless whether you pray prayers like a machine or you pray prayers for a million hours none of us had the capacity of relating with the father you know sidelining the blood of Jesus it is impossible it is the blood of Jesus that became the bridging point that became the bridge between uh, the bridge between our the relationship of the father and us it is the blood of Jesus that you know that made right that relationship that got broken in Genesis chapter number three understand that for more than four thousand years thereabout the relationship between God and man was corrupted was interfered with because of the sin of disobedience in the garden of Eden it is through the blood of Jesus that that reconciliation was made or was done it is the reason why when Jesus is on the cross, when he is uh, quoting Psalms 22 and verse number 3 or verse number 2, Eloi, Eloi, oh my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? The reason why the father was silent is because the relationship had to be, you know, had to be mend. The relationship had to be worked upon. And the father had to allow 
that the death that he has spoken about to Adam were coming in another broadcast and we will look at the sin of the first Adam and the righteousness of the second Adam or we will look at um, the mistakes of the first Adam and what Jesus made right. We will look at what the mess of Adam and we will look at the exploits of Christ. We'll look at what Adam, what by Adam what came into us and by Christ what came into us. But that's not my topic for today. My topic for today is the exploits of the blood of Jesus. So it is the blood of Jesus that reconciled us unto the Father. Now I want everyone to hear me. There is no other avenue for having a relationship with the Father apart from the avenue of the Lord Jesus Christ through his blood. God told Moses, when I see the blood, I will pass over. It is when God sees the blood of his Son, because it is the eternal blood. When God sees the blood of his son, we'll come to that. Is the, uh, a verse in Hebrews 10, 29. Don't go there right now. We're coming to that right now. Uh, it talks about the eternal blood. Now, when God sees the blood of his son, I picked that verse so that I can show you. Though the blood was shed at Calvary, it did not lose its impact. It did not lose its capacity until now. That blood is as fresh as it was in the days uh, when, it was, uh, when it was poured out at, at, at Calvary. Now, when God sees the blood, it is how he is able to speak unto us. Understand? No priest in the Old Testament would enter into the Holy of Holies without the blood. So the relationship between the priest and the father by, you know, in the Old Testament was primarily through the blood. And the blood was for washing the priest. The blood was for, you know, for, you know mediating between the people and the father through the priest and so on and so forth. But the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ... It has reconciled, it has reconciled us with the Father. It is the blood of Jesus that allows the Father now to speak to us. It is the blood of Jesus that allows us to hear when the Father speaks. The blood of Jesus is the channel, is the medium through which we are able to interact with the Father. Without the blood, it is impossible to relate with the Father. So the blood of Jesus reconcile, reconciles us or reconciled man with divinity. Now, the sixth word that you will find is the word redeem. Is the word redeemed. Now I have many verses for this, but I would use Colossians chapter number one and verse number 14 because you were in Colossians 1, verse number 20. So I can use Colossians 1, 1 and verse number 14. It says this that in whom we have redemption through his blood. Again, the forgiveness of sin I have dealt with that. So understand, you see, these words they point to the same, but they are not the same. The attack on sin is very specific. There is the attack on sin which is cleansing, there's the attack on sin which is sanctification, there's the attack on sin which is the cleansing of the conscience, there's the attack on sin which is now, you know, the forgiveness, the remission, there's the attack on sin which is um, the reconciliation, there's the attack on sin now which is redemption. Now, redemption simply means that um, in Genesis chapter number 3, the devil gained a higher ground as far as humanity was concerned. That in Genesis chapter number 3, when Eve and Adam, or when Adam and Eve submitted to the lies and the deception and the cunningness of Satan, now the devil gained an upper heart. And that is why you will understand that even in the book of Luke chapter number 4 and Matthew chapter number 4, when you read the temptations of, 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 of Satan to Christ, you realize that the second temptation, the devil is telling Jesus that if you can worship me, I will give you the kingdoms. Why would he give him the kingdoms and he never created anything? It is because in Genesis chapter number 3, the authority and the dominion that God had given to Adam in Genesis 1 verse number 26, it is what the devil took from Adam and Eve. Now understand there is no dominion without a kingdom. There is no kingdom without a dominion. So the dominion that God had given to Adam and Eve was taken forcefully through cunningness and deception and through their disobedience to the father. So at that particular point, now you understand that the father also understands it. And that is why when God comes to listen to whatever has happened, you know, he's, 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 he's coming like, like um, you know, like a newscaster. He's coming like a journalist and he's like, Adam, what happened here? And Adam tells him father you know it is the woman that you gave unto me and God is like Eve what happened and Eve is like it is 
the serpent um, and uh, God did not ask the serpent what happened here and from that moment God starts issuing judgment and he says as far as you know, you know the woman is concerned you will have you know pain in your childbearing and, and so on and so forth then he looks at Adam he says Adam now this is what this will be the repercussion of your disobedience I will make I will make it hard for you that you will eat everything from the sweat of your brow now and when he comes to the devil he tells the devil that you will eat the dust and that is why we keep saying that um, the position of the enemy is where he uh, is under our feet where he eats the dust not your finances not your marriage not your to be consuming that what is supposed to be consuming is dust and we have a lot of dust in the world it's a song we used to sing back in the days and it was something like another one bites the dust so the devil is supposed to bite the dust continually consistently that tells you we have come from somewhere. We were not born saints like you. We were born sinners. Then the blood, the blood. The redemption we are talking about here, if you look at 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 18 and 19, 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 18 and 19, it will tell us that we have not been, you know, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver, gold, uh, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Notice it is from your fathers. So from Adam, all this, you know, it, it, it kept on compounding until to where we are. But it says that we've been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, redemption means that in Genesis chapter number three, the devil gained an upper hand and it, it, it became it's like he was owed something that needed to be paid so that he will be able to release the dominion and the authority that he had. Now, please, Father, help me. In Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 19, Jesus says that I, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. But when you look at Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18, after the resurrection, he says that all power and authority in the heavens and on the earth and under the earth has been given to me. Now understand, he is showing us that the debt that, 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 that was owed to the devil by the blood of Jesus, the blood became the currency that purchased our redemption. So whatever the devil held against us, the dominion, the authority, the, the relationship he messed between us and the Father, you know, the way we were chased from the Garden of Eden, whatever the devil, you know, triggered to happen, and he, um, you know, he took, it's like he took us, you know, he took us into captivity, and um, he demanded a ransom. So he hijacked us, and he demanded a ransom. Now, that ransom price was paid by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. I want you to understand, child of God, there are some of us who've lived our life is as if we owe the devil an explanation for something. And it is as if until now, the devil has a right to your finances. The devil has a right to your pain. The devil has a right to, you know, your children. The devil has a right to your parents. The devil has a right, you know, to you not being married. The devil has a, it's like you feel Honestly, because of A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, the devil has a right. I want, to I want you to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church at this hour. The devil has no right to anything that pertains to your life. He has no right to your health. He has no right to your finances. He has no right to your rising. He has no right to your spreading. He has no right to your movement. He has no right at all. Whatever was the ransom price that he demanded, it was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ by the shedding of his own blood. That is why now Paul tells the church in Colossae that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I want you to understand up. I don't know what the devil has stretched his heart and touched in your life. I want you to know he is only touching whatever he's touching in your life because you have allowed him. He has no right. He has no permission. He has no allowance to touch anything in your life. One, the price was paid and Jesus said in John chapter number 19 and verse number 30, it is finished. I want you to know that the scores were settled. I want you to know that the debt was paid in full. I want you to know that there is nothing that, that, that remain for you to pay. What is remaining now is for us to be in obedience with Christ and to follow the principles of the kingdom. Now Paul says this, that we are not ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Now, I want you to understand one of the avenues that the devil uses. We'll come back and teach on this more. One of the avenues that the devil uses, I don't know how many preachings for online broadcasts I have accumulated as of now. 
uh, one of the avenues that the devil uses against so many people is the avenue of ignorance. Notice, when the devil comes in, in, in Genesis chapter number 3, he rides on the ignorance of even Adam. And um, Adam had been spoken unto by the father in Genesis chapter number 2, the tree that he was not to eat. But when it comes to Eve, when the devil comes, he does not go to Adam, he goes to Eve. And he asks Eve a question that when, when you digest it and when you look at it right well, you'll understand. If, if you do your surgery on this question, you realize that what the devil was looking for, he was looking for a loose end and he found it. He asked Eve, did the father say, did God say? So what the devil was provoking is the ignorance that was in Eve. I want to say this. The Lord Jesus Christ has purchased, he has redeemed us. But if you're still in ignorance, the purchase that was done will never benefit you.